Sarah Rule had a lot to smile about. She had her first play to make it onto Broadway and had just given birth to twins after a high-risk pregnancy. I was hugely relieved to have had these healthy babies, like I'd passed through the eye of a needle or through the eye of a very big storm. But what Sarah didn't realize was that an even bigger storm lay ahead. A lactation consultant was helping me learn to breastfeed when she looked at my face and said, your eye looks a little droopy. In fact, my whole left side of my face had fallen down and was quite frozen. Sarah was diagnosed with Bell's palsy, an unexplained facial paralysis that usually lasts a few weeks or months, but in rare cases can be permanent. You don't know quite exactly what causes it or quite what cures it, and it took me a really long time to recover any movement in my face at all. The condition has made Sarah understand how much we rely on our facial expression to convey emotion and has forced her to rethink and relearn how to communicate. It was shocking to realize how much I relied on my smile. It was kind of excruciating, the gulf between what I was feeling and what I could express on my face. Now in a new memoir, Smile, the story of a face, Sarah recounts the life lessons she's learned from battling Bell's palsy. I think writing the book itself was a form of healing. What it made me realize that was that my voice was there all along. Please welcome to the Chan fam, Sarah Rule. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. I, I mean, your book is absolutely beautiful. And the storytelling, I think, oh, it makes me... It's so emotional when you talk about your voice being there all along. Mm. When you heard those words from the nurse saying, what's going on? And then you got to the mirror to see for yourself. Explain what that felt like, Sarah, in that moment. What was strange is I felt like an entirely different person before and after looking in the mirror. And I looked in the mirror and this side of my face had completely fallen down and was completely frozen. And I thought I might have had a stroke, and my husband's a doctor, and he said, you know, have a neurologist come in, and they diagnosed Bell's palsy. Had you ever heard of Bell's palsy before? I actually had, because my mother had had it in her 50s, and she recovered quite quickly, but I, I at least knew what it was. When, as you pointed out, your mother recovered, so you're told that this is Bell's palsy, and I'm sure you thought, okay, well, this is not permanent. It wasn't permanent for my mom. I'll be okay. But when the days and weeks started to go by and the change was small, yeah. what, what was that worry like for you? I think that's the terrifying thing about a chronic condition is the incremental change a long time. It's just something you carry with you all the time. And with, with Bell's palsy, they sort of tell you if you're not better in six months, you probably won't get better. So... You know, I just kept hoping, and I also kept shoving aside my worry way down deep and just kept, try kept trying to live my life uh, and take care of three kids and, and write plays and, and be a wife and mother um, and a writer. Uh, but as the days and weeks passed, it was sort of excruciating, particularly not being able to smile at my babies. And that's the thing, here you are, at this joyous time in your life and the thing you want to do, the smile is gone. Mm -hmm. How did you start piecing together the, the idea that I don't need this smile, it's because this smile won't keep away my joy. I love that, this smile won't keep away my joy. That's beautifully said. I mean, I think we are our face, but we're not our face. Our smile is our joy and our smile is also not our joy. And living with that ambiguity was something that took me about 10 years, I think, to figure out, you know, how could I use my voice to express love to my babies? Mm. How could um, they interpret that my intention was smiling all along, even when I thought it looked like a grimace and not like a smile? What did you do to convey that joy to them? I mean, I think about when I speak to Moses and I'm, ha! Yeah. yeah. You know, what, how did you learn and train yourself to connect with those babies? I think it was in the voice. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems appropriate for this show because I looked back at pictures of myself when they were little, and there's so few pictures because I hated having pictures taken of my face at that time. 
And so much of our culture is visual right now, and it's, it's like it didn't happen if there's no picture of it. And so I thought, where was I at that time? But I have these videos where I have my voice speaking to the babies, and in my voice, there's all the love and joy and connection that I was worried wasn't coming through my face. And I know you've regained um, much of the motion, um, clearly. It is not back to where it was yeah. prior to. It sounds to me as if your children, though, became this springboard. You know, if I can communicate and, and show this joy with an infant, now let me just keep building mm -hmm. on that to finding the voice of Sarah that I know mm -hmm. and Sarah that is confident in who she is and what she's created on Broadway and outside mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, I think I was hiding for quite some time because I couldn't use my face the way I was used to using it. I think I kind of became an observer, mm -hmm. which is natural for a writer. But I think writing the book allowed me out of that observer role into a kind of finding one's voice again. Mm -hmm. And I also think what you said about children is right. like that my children loved me unconditionally the whole time and accepted my smile as it was completely. Yeah. And my daughter said to me once, um, mom, the way I think of it is your face was sort of like this beautiful house. And one day a wall came crashing down and you kept trying to rebuild it brick by brick and you couldn't quite. But when we looked at your face, all we saw was our home. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, Sarah, you talk about, you've said that all, we all grow from our obstacles. And this was an obstacle that I'm sure many days seemed insurmountable. But you found your voice through this book. Was that liberating for you? It really was. I mean, I didn't talk to anyone about having Bell's palsy. I didn't talk to my friends about it. I think there's something about the face where it's almost impolite to ask someone. Mm about something that's on their face that you don't expect, an asymmetry. And as a result, I felt hugely isolated about it. And my husband happens to be a psychiatrist. And he was like, why, why are you writing about it? You usually write about things that trouble you and that you think about a lot. You're troubled about this. You think about it a lot. And I said, oh, no, it's too personal. <laughs> I'm not writing it. But I think once I started, it was really cathartic to just make sense of the story. Well, and I think that of, of many people, whether it's a challenge that you face um, like this or others, we all have this book inside of us, so to speak. Uh -huh. That doesn't mean we're going to all write it. But we have this book, and we, are con we convince ourselves, no one wants to hear that. Mm -hmm. No one wants to hear that. And then suddenly you share your story. And I tell people all the time, someone will lean in on it. There will be something about your journey, no matter how small you think it is or how many people don't care, they will care. And you found this way to do this with the book in a life lessons kind of way. Well, it's so beautiful what you say. We all have this book in us. I think we all do have a book in us, a story of our yeah. lives. And I think for me, Bell's palsy was a way in, but it's not the totality of the right. story. And I think for anyone who's felt like, oh, when I look in the mirror, it doesn't match what I'm feeling in my inner landscape. I think that yeah. the book is for them or anyone who has a chronic illness or an yeah. asymmetry in a world that insists you be highly symmetrical. It's also about not shrinking yourself down, uh -huh. right? I mean, we can feel, oh, well, I, I, no one wants to hear from me. I, I, I'm from here or I don't make millions of dollars or I don't do this. And we shrink ourselves down. Even in my world, in my show, there have been times where I've said, okay, let me shrink myself down. I don't want people to think this. Or I don't want them to feel like, oh, now she's got the talk show, she thinks. And you shrink yourself down in rooms that you should be able to be your full, authentic self. Yeah. And I know that people with disabilities that I've talked with all across the world say that they feel that way. Yeah. I feel like I have to shrink myself down. Instead, I got the best story in the room. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I think there are a million and one ways to hide from life. And the written word for me is, is a way out of that situation.